So if you've ever wondered whether soda or Coke or cola, whatever you want to call it, actually hurts your bones, you're not alone. Patients ask me this actually all the time, especially women who are doing everything right and still worried about their osteoporosis or low bone density. So today what I want to do is I want to unpack what the research really shows. I want to talk about why cola looks different than potentially other fizzy drinks and where maybe diet sodas fit in and most importantly what to drink instead. Now let's start with the big picture. Osteoporosis isn't just a quote unquote T-score. It's an imbalance of bone metabolism and a health span story. Strong bones reflect strong muscles. Strong bones reflect a good nutrient status, optimized hormones, optimized daily habits. You see, our bones are always telling us a story, and I really want us all to start listening better to our bones. So then when we talk about soda, or again, cola, or Coke, or whatever you want to call it, whatever part of the country you're from, I'm not really looking for a villain here. I'm looking for levers, places that you can make simple swaps that support your skeleton in your health span for the decades to come. So there were some headlines a while back that put this topic on the map, and it comes from the Framingham Osteoporosis Study. I'm going to, at some point, do a full review on this paper because there's actually a whole lot in there to talk about. And if you wanna make sure that you get to see that one, please subscribe to this channel and sign up for notifications so you don't miss it. Now, in this one part of the Framingham Osteoporosis Study, which was published in 2006, researchers looked at over 2,500 adults between the ages of roughly 30 and 87. They measured bone density using DEXA and then compared those values to the detailed food frequency questionnaires that they were using in the Framingham study. And so the question at hand was simple. Does soft drink intake relate to bone mineral density? And the short answer is yes, but it wasn't all soft drinks. It wasn't all sodas that tracked with lower bone mineral density. It was colas specifically. So from a numbers perspective, women who drank cola daily had hip bone density about 3-5% to 5 lower than women who drank cola rarely or never. This pattern held for both sugared and diet colas, caffeinated and decaf colas, and then non-cola carbonated beverages showed no association. So there's something about the cola. It's not just the bubbles. So the question I have is why could that be and is there something that we're getting in our diet that could potentially be provoking bone loss? So it doesn't seem to be sparkling water or lemon lime beverages. It seems to be cola specifically. So the question is why? So there's two suspects that come to the top of mind. One would be caffeine because we've talked about that before and the other is phosphoric acid which is unique to colas over other carbonated beverages. So caffeine can increase calcium losses in urine and I've talked about this before but if you're looking at caffeine as a culprit, it really is only a culprit in extreme excess and also if calcium intake is already low. So in the right person, too much caffeine could actually be a bad thing. But when you look in the Framingham study in real life, the association with lower bone mineral density didn't hold up when they accounted for caffeine. So again, it wasn't the caffeine because even decaf cola showed a weaker but still present signal. So again, maybe there was a little signal there, maybe that's just noise, hard to know. And I've actually published on this before, so if you uh, search coffee or tea on my channel, you'll find the comparison I did of coffee and tea and caffeine, which is where we talk about caffeine in moderation, which is not a word that I like in particular, but in this case it actually does work because if you stay under certain thresholds of caffeine, and I forget what it was, I think it was 300 milligrams a day, um, if you stay under that threshold, there doesn't seem to be a caffeine issue. For people that are consuming more, whether it be coffee or, or you know, whatever beverage that gets you over that amount, we don't really know, again, if it's the caffeine or is it something else that's associated with that type of diet because these are not intervention studies. Now, I've actually seen this phosphoric acid term used for people trying to say that we need to alkalize the body and alkalize the blood and that you need to avoid phosphoric acid. It's not the acid part actually that matters. You see what phosphoric acid does is deliver a concentrated source of phosphorus without any balancing calcium or magnesium or potassium. So it's not the acid form of it, it's the fact that it comes alone. And people talk about calcium here because calcium is the most direct counterbalance to pair with phosphorus and bone mineral. If you look in the bone, they actually are frequently paired together. But magnesium could also do it, potassium could also do it, and when you consume phosphorus from whole foods, it also seems to support the bone matrix, and when you consume it with these other minerals, then it sort of buffers the acid-base effects of phosphorus alone. That's why we should be eating a whole food diet. 
When these minerals are absent, phosphorus acts unopposed, and the body compensates by drawing more heavily on the bone reserves of calcium or wherever it can. When phosphorus intake is high and the calcium intake is relatively low, the body senses this dip in blood calcium and responds by raising parathyroid hormone. If you've ever heard me talk about parathyroid hormone, you know that if somebody has too much parathyroid hormone, usually either because of low vitamin D levels or because they actually have a parathyroid tumor, you know that that is a powerful stimulus for bone loss. So in animal and metabolic studies, this combination of high phosphorus and low calcium creates this term hypercalciuria, right? So we see people diagnosed with this hypercalciuria, they're losing calcium in their urine, but the question is why? And in this circumstance, it's the exposure to phosphorus without balancing minerals, and then ultimately an elevated parathyroid hormone, although I'm sure likely it'd be hard to catch in blood, but all of this together accelerates bone turnover. Studies on humans consuming colas do have lower hip bone mineral density even after adjusting for total calcium intake. It seems that there is some signal around the imbalance of phosphorus relative to calcium or other balancing minerals that tips the scale into bone loss. And you've heard me talk about this. I mentioned it at the beginning of this video. Osteoporosis is an imbalance of bone metabolism. So when you're consuming something that is tilting you in the wrong direction, if you are on the edge, that little bit of push, that little bit of lever might actually push you into losing bone more than gaining bone. So then the follow-up question to this is, well, what about phosphorus from food? Because I've heard this one too. If you look at dietary phosphorus from whole foods, like meat, like dairy, like legumes, nuts, it comes packaged with protein and magnesium and often calcium, especially in dairy. So let's just give a couple of examples. So a three ounce serving of beef provides roughly 180 to 200 milligrams of phosphorus, but it also comes with 20 plus grams of protein and other minerals and vitamins that are gonna be helping out the bone. A cup of milk has about 230 milligrams of phosphorus, but it delivers 300 milligrams of calcium at the same time. If you contrast that with a 12 ounce can of cola, that contains about 40 to 50 milligrams of phosphorus, but almost entirely as phosphoric acid. It is not balanced. There's no calcium, there's no protein, there's no buffering nutrients at all. So even though the amount of phosphorus is actually significantly lower, there's nothing to counterbalance it. It is not a whole food. In fact, arguably, it's not a food at all. So if you take this into real life clinical scenarios, where is this actually an issue? Like what are the patterns that I would get concerned if someone were telling me about their diet or tracking their diet? What I would be concerned about is frequent cola exposure with no dairy, no other calcium sources, potentially a low calcium diet, and a diet that's light on other minerals and protein. So this is a ultra processed food diet, right? This is the standard American diet, unfortunately. Over years, even small daily imbalances do tend to add up. If you keep just pushing, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, over time, you're losing bone. And then there's another dietary concern here, and this is the concern around what's called displacement. So if you're consuming a 12 ounce cola, especially a caloric one, it might actually be displacing other calories that you're gonna get from whole food sources. Although arguably this is why it leads to obesity because maybe it doesn't do this, but still if you're consuming, especially several of them a day, you start talking about several hundred calories coming from these colas that could potentially displace other nutrient dense food. So then let's double click on the diet soda concept. So if you take out the sugar, is there still going to be an issue? And I said earlier, the effect is yes. In the Framingham study, we did see that diet soda is still tracked with lower hip bone mineral density in women. But again, it just wasn't as strong of a signal. So is it because they were drinking less when you adjust for that? So when they do a food frequency questionnaire, you're not just calculating, you know, I had four here or six here, usually there is a range. And so it's a little hard to put those numbers together. All we can say is, you know, a certain amount of exposure, which is gonna be within a range. So it's hard to get really specific here. Plus, nobody really remembers that much. If you ask yourself, you know, what did I eat? a month ago, what did I eat on Tuesday, four weeks ago, it's really hard to know. You can get, you can get an estimate, it's like I usually have about two of those a day, um, and then also we tend to, as humans, lie when people ask us what we eat. So again, <clears throat> food frequency questionnaires aren't awesome, but it just gives us some broad data to talk about. So then let's talk about some alternatives, because I'm a big fan of sparkling water myself. This is sort of my like, quote unquote, happy hour drink, is a non-alcoholic, you know, non, sometimes non-flavored, sometimes flavored, but still just a sparkling water, a mineral water that is cold. 
Is the carbonation itself hurting my bones? Could it be hurting your bones? Well, we don't see that same signal when it comes to plain seltzers, club soda, mineral waters. If the bubbles help you hydrate, if you like it, then enjoy them. I don't think there's any negative to that other than potentially the cost or where the water's coming from. And this doesn't just come from one study. There's actually other studies and I'll link to this one below. There's an observational study that looked at young women, teen girls that have shown higher fracture risk with frequent soft drink consumption, especially cola. This is important to identify because this is a different population and yet we have the same risk factor coming forward. So you could argue that maybe Framingham was an older population, although it was a really broad population age, but still this is a younger population and we still see the same risk come forward. So then what's the takeaway here? What do we do with this? Well, I'm not here to shame your cola consumption. You know, if you love to have a, a cola at, you know, a ball game or a movie, like when I go to the movies with the kids, sometimes I will have a little bit of Coke Zero, right? But it's rare in those circumstances. It's not most of the time, it's not most days, and it's certainly not multiple times throughout the day. All right, so let's talk about some really clear alternatives. I mentioned this earlier, mineral water actually has a great source of minerals, depending on which uh, company you're buying from, but some of these are really mineral dense with phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, lots of minerals in good mineral water. Sometimes plain sparkling water is fine. Again, question the source, I wonder where it comes from you can get bubbles without phosphoric acid. All right, number two would be dairy milk or some kind of a nut milk. Now, I'm not a big fan of nut milks, but some people really enjoy them. They use it as a source of calcium because it is fortified, although please consider that more like a supplement. I don't love them because of the additional ingredients that are added to them, but again, for some people it makes sense. Now dairy, again, is not tolerated by everybody. We talk about this a lot, but if you can tolerate it and it's not inflammatory, it is a powerful tool for additional dietary fat, calories, protein, and calcium and other minerals. All right, the number three thing would be unsweetened tea. So both green and black tea bring a lot of polyphenols to the game. They have been shown, and I've published on this, a positive influence on bone turnover. So if you're sensitive to caffeine, you could use a decaf version or you could maybe just keep it earlier in the day. But when I look at caffeine from coffee and tea, again, moderation is, is the term. I don't like it, but this is the term I would use with caffeine here. I believe it's under 300 milligrams and tea outperforms coffee. I'm not entirely sure why, but tea outperforms coffee when you look at large populations. Now, personally, if we're gonna choose between tea and coffee, I drink coffee in the morning. It is just my routine. I go to sleep looking forward to my coffee in the morning. So I'm not giving that up without a really compelling reason too. I'll drink tea in the evening that is decaf and technically not green tea or black tea. So it's actually not really tea, but it's a hot beverage with a bag in it of something that flavors it like a, like a ginseng or a turmeric tea. I like to drink that in the evenings uh, to help wind down. Uh, but for those that enjoy black tea, green tea, probably a better choice than coffee. If caffeine bothers you, do it earlier in the day. All right, so the two big takeaways are these. Number one, you can drink carbonated drinks and not compromise your bone health. The signal is around cola or phosphoric acid, specifically not around carbonation. Number two is that diet soda is not a better alternative for your bones or probably for anything for that matter. Now, if this rings true for you or someone you know and they're struggling with bone health or you are, consider that this is actually not one of the most important levers that we talk about. We actually run a masterclass every week where we talk about the five most common mistakes that we see people make on their bone health journey. These big mistakes can definitely prevent people from seeing success in improving their bone metabolism, improving their bone health. So if you haven't been to this masterclass and you're on a bone health journey, please consider joining me in this masterclass so that I can help you time collapse your road to success. You can look for that link in the description on YouTube, or you can check us out at osteocollective.com. So that's it for today. I hope you remember, please, that life should be about honoring your health and aging with strength and grace.